in the morning. <laughs> On the East Coast of the United States, I have no idea what time it is down and under. But it is time for Shiny Side Out with Dave and Mecky. So I hope you have your tinfoil hat all made and cinched down tight over your ears. So take it away, Dave and Mecky. Hello and welcome to Shiny Side Out with Dave and Mickey the crowd goes wild on WZZR broadcasting from Australia from Revolution Radio on revolutionradio.com. Sorry, revolution.radio, revolution.radio, it's a whole new thing. Where it's more than just radio, so jump in the chat room if you can. Hope you can. This is show number 428. Is it really? Yeah. Damn, that's, that's a big number. <laughs> 10 years. 10 years, guys. We are hitting into our 10th year on the air, just to let you know. It's on air, online, and on your smart device. So grab an app to listen anywhere. Anywhere at all. In fact, if you're on the space station, you can hear us. Or listen at home on a Grace Tabletop digital radio, radio, radio. And on the space station, it's very, very um, topical. Uh, SpaceX launched two astronauts to the but space, to we'll the uh, space station. <laughs> Uh, we will get into it, absolutely, but you can listen there if you want to. Now, if you missed Solaris' show, shame on you, shame on me, shame on me, always shame on me. Uh, but again, time is never yours when you have a massive family. Now, she was talking to Shane Sirius, and I, was, I hope I said that right, Sirius? Uh, French, and they uh, were, French. Oh, oh. Oh, Sirois. Shane Sirois. And they were discussing paranormal um, right up our alley. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe Dave listened to it. We can yeah, ask we him in a second. Now, but if you did miss it, and you know, look, it happens. And if you catch us on uh, YouTube, you probably definitely missed it. Um, you should go and spend five dollars a month, five dollars US a month, thereabouts, to access the Freedom Slips archives. So you, you know, you go and subscribe. You can access the archives as much as you like. All the shows, her shows, our shows, anyone's shows. And there's some really good information there, right? You want some alternative news, some alternative media, some alternative opinions, things that you probably wouldn't get ac come across or get across in your everyday life. Certainly not a mainstream media. This is the place to get it. Five dollars a month, get all her shows. She's a she's a pioneer, a groundbreaker. Powerhouse. Um, yeah, she you 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 research her history and uh, you um you do have to take your head off and you doff your head in respect and you bow your head and you do all the things that you should do. To someone that has lived it because that's what research does the mere fact that she hasn't become a recluse and just snubs society is yeah. crazy right yeah, because the things that happened to her yeah. happened to you know uh, it would uh, undo many people uh, so that's my uh, my love true. and respect goes right out to her i don't know dave feels the same same now before we get into the meat of this this is the serious bit of mm -hmm. the show but we'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land here in australia and I think it's a, it's a good idea to do it for all the um, um, elder cultures that were um, supplanted for the most part by the European uh, colonizers. Uh, that's, that's, that's what this is. The, we wouldn't be saying any of this if there hadn't been any European colonizers, Dave, right? Yeah, this that's is, right. This is really what this is. Um, but I yeah, so it could for, have been another group at a later oh, date or a prior sure. date or whatever, right? Sure. <laughs> and look, that's, that's the way the history ran. Yeah, yeah, you're right. History is not perfect. There, there are no innocents in, in in history, really. Um, but certainly, um, the Europeans did, did quite a job of colonizing and and uh, bringing mayhem and general disorder. So we would like to um, respect and um, call out and acknowledge the traditional custodians. Uh, for me, here in uh, Pemulwuy, it's the the Rock people, and here yeah. in Narara, it's the Dark and Jewel. Thank you. And both Narara, interestingly enough, as well as Pemulwuy. Uh, Aboriginal names. Now they're not. Well, in my case, Pebbleway is not a place name. It is a place name now. It was a, the name of a warrior that mm. uh, killed a games keeper for one of the earlier or the earliest governors in Australia. Uh, I don't know what Narara was. Oh, Narara a, a place? Yeah, yeah, it's it's the mm -hmm. Aboriginal place names are usually describing something that is um, a prevalent or amazing about it. Some memory to do with a, a place and the oh, rara wow. means black snake oh, and wow. in here we have red belly black snakes and those two colors in nature they tell you something yeah go, go walk the other way <laughs> yeah walk the other way and I, Quickly, I've, seen, but... I've seen some very large ones like off the charts large and yeah. they're truly aggressive if you disturb them when they're sunning themselves other than that they'll you know pretty, pretty much get out of your way so yeah, that, that's that's with but, they're, of but they're, they're not they're not in the i think they're not in the top five 
most venomous they are certainly venomous and mm. they will kill you if they had a choice <laughs> oh, they kill you um what what they ha what they do do though is keep the brown snakes away and the the eastern brown is um extremely lethal yeah. to the point where you don't get to even talk to the emergency services before passing away and that's that's why you shouldn't kill huntsmen either they they get rid of the uh, more dangerous pests around your house huntsmen won't kill you they can bite you but they won't kill you yeah it, and it's and a with... painful bite too oh, let me tell yeah. you mum got bit too I, I i never was bit i was lucky but you're yeah. right dave it's it's it, it, and it, it it's permanent the, the 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 marks will stay with you yeah of of that I, bite. I, but I, look, with... I put a container over them slide some cardboard up and i take them outside and release them because they're they're a natural thing and you know what we're living in their environment yeah like that's that's right you know it's, even if you've got arachnophobia it's, it's all good you know thank i get you, it you. i've seen people empty a whole clip on them and they just walk away from it so you're, a whole clip i mean like a can of more that seems slightly slightly excessive no, a <laughs> but, whole yeah, can no, of mortine mortine yeah. does nothing it's, it's yeah, one yeah. of our insecticides it does nothing to spiders to arachnids yeah. so people think i'm gonna drown it at least it's not dying i'll just drown i'll empty the whole can so I, I joke about clip, uh, you know, like like it's a weapon, and uh, yeah, like they they just they just get up and walk out of the the pool of yeah. Mortine. Crazy. Uh, and look, uh, with this acknowledgement, though, we'd like to pay our respects to elders, past, present, and future, and hope that uh, we will learn to respect the land because I believe very firmly mm. that the elder cultures, and we're seeing we're seeing evidence for this today. The elder cultures could live in harmony with the environment. Um, it's it's only our greed. It really is just that. It's the greed that we seem to um, mm -hmm. cultivate in, in our particular form of civilization that is putting us at odds with nature. Nothing, that, nothing else does. It's just the greed. And yeah. if you look at Brazil, the um, you know the, the Amazon basin, which I believe was a parkland once, my mm -hmm. belief only, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you look at Australia, any of the natives, any of the native uh, um, or, or the original. Inhabitants, even the original, uh, let's call them the European tribes, right? Before we started to invent massive cities and, and massive industries and so forth, we also lived in relative harmony uh, with nature, uh, Europeans, that is. Um, so it's not something that is unnatural mm. or unknown to any of us. It is just something we have forgotten or maybe chosen to ignore in, in the um, pursuit of, well, more. Dave, in the pursuit of more, when is when 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 is enough enough? The answer is never. It's never enough, Dave. That's what it is. There's no enough. <laughs> Ask a billionaire um, if they'd like more money, and oh. they'll say they'll push you out of the way, saying, "Where is it?" Um, thank you for that. Sorry, so thank you for that segue. I just I got go one on, thing, and then I want to get into your news, yeah. and I'll tell you I'll tell you what that is. So recently, I started watching um, uh, Filthy Rich. Filthy Rich is a four-part Netflix documentary. I've only seen the first three episodes. I haven't seen the fourth one yet. Mm -hmm. uh, the Life and Times of Jeffrey Epstein. The Life wow. and Times of Jeff Epstein. And it goes into some detail. So these are one-hour long episodes going into some detail uh, uh, around Jeff Epstein's um, crimes, uh, general life dealings, yep. uh, victims, uh, how the system completely fails his victims, how the system completely folded. Well, actually, this failed is wrong. The system a a accommodated him. The system uh, cut deals yeah, with him. And right. I'm looking forward to, yeah, I'm looking yeah. forward to part number four. I, I don't know how far they're going to go in this part number four, but let me tell you, they have mentioned all the names. They said the royals by name. They said them. Um, Bill Clinton, they said all these people that were on, on the island. Holy you know, dude. Weinstein was hanging with him. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's. They, some names were names were named, <laughs> um, and and I still maintain that he didn't kill himself. Is my opinion only, yeah. of course. And he was he had to he had to he had to die if and this I'm looking forward to part four, simply because if he had gone to trial, all of it would have come out. That's Every true. Every last mm -hmm. bit, right? Um, but sorry, so yeah, if you, if you get a chance to, to watch it on Netflix, um, Filthy Rich, the Jeff Epstein, I think it's called the Jeff Epstein story or some such. Uh, not not that hard to find, obviously. And it's it's a recent thing, right? And and like I said, part four. <laughs> I, I hope, <laughs> I hope they're gonna go into uh, into uh, the more well the well the conclusion. I mean, they wouldn't have made it before his death. I, I shouldn't think. Uh, no, I, see, I, I if if he, indeed he was accidented um out um or whether the palace had anything to do with it 
I think they're still that's still going to remain in the air. Um, I wonder how they're going to conclude it, Mickey. Imagine the you'd need an army of lawyers, the oh. legal team, to write oh. this so that you could get away with naming <laughs> but, but anyone. The, but see, this is the thing. I, I mean, this this came out. Book. Yes. That's it, right? No, no, absolutely, but it came out recently. So it came out this year, right? Obviously, it's so fairly recently. Um, yeah. And I haven't seen any laws since I haven't seen anything, but clearly they have named names, right? It's, it's, mm. it's, and the, there's evidence mounting and every. So if, if you were named and the evidence exists, you would not start a lawsuit. I mean, David Icke has said that a whole bunch of people are shape shifting uh, reptilian. Um, yeah. I guess uh, being from the suing you or David. There you right? go. That's right. And, and no one has ever taken David Icke to court for anything. No. Um, now you could argue that well, it's just insane what he says. That's that's one you know point of view. The other Ooh. is that you know well, maybe there's something to it. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know. I, I I honestly don't know what the answer is. If, you know, but but I certainly uh, it's, I find it curious because I mean at least slander. You're saying I'm a I'm a blood drinking, uh, shape shifting uh, reptilian from the law fourth oh, dimension. Well, we'll I'll, we'll have our day in court, sir. <laughs> That's what we'll yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you weren't, surely that was like the um, the Jordan from the uh, YouTube channel Friendly Geordies. Little plug. Uh, I like his work. He's He's maybe a little left, maybe a little bit more left than maybe I am today. Maybe I was a little bit more left than he is now. Um, but uh, Clive, um, what's his name? The the large fellow that was in Australian politics opened up the aluminium mine and basically... Oh! Uh, Clive yeah, Palmer. Yeah, yeah. Ah. Clive Palmer. Clive, that's it, yep. All right, so he, he called Clive Palmer a name and Clive Palmer served him uh with a lawsuit except the guy from friendly geordies proved that nothing that he said was his opinion in fact it was the collective consciousness of the australian people <laughs> every single word every single word he had proof for and his legal team had done really well a really good job um defending it and uh it there was no pursuit mickey none I, like I can't. It. I'm not allowed to on on radio say what he'd called him openly. But they, you found clips of an entire audience of football uh, audience at a stadium shouting the same chant. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's hilarious. So yeah, you're right, Mickey. If, if there wasn't, if there was no proof, right, um, people would be all over it. So yeah, you I think so. I think yeah. it's I think it's astounding. I I started watching because you've been watching this one. I can't wait to start watching it. I'd I'd love to see it. Um, just give it some, you know, validity, I think, right? Because where is it now? Who's talking mm. about it now? The virus has taken over, you know? Yes. We're not, no one's talking about anything. I said, I've been watching Chernobyl. And um, I had I had a really hard time. If you haven't seen it, the first episode is extremely difficult to watch because of, I suppose, you know, uh, upstarts wanting, to, you know, not believing what they were hearing, and um, and people's lives, and every single time a scene changed in new people, I go, "You're dead." <laughs> spoiler yeah. alert! Spoiler alert! Um, and that's just that's pretty tough. I think it's pretty. tough. It was a really hard watch, Mickey. And um, yeah, I don't it's know. reality though. I mean, it's what happened. Oh, right? it's reality, all right. But look, let, let's let's go straight to the virus. So, as a virus update. Um, I found the news, Mackie, I did, from the 5th of May, only the 5th, when we only just breached the 4 million total confirmed, according to the Centre for Systems Science and Engineering at John Hopkins University uh, data collection point. And there's, there are many. Um, you can find them wherever you find them. There are, you'll see the same data. So confirmed cases was 4 million back in the fifth, and now it's 6 million. Mm. Today we hit 6 million. Well, it's not at 6.1, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's it's, it's growing, right? But it's just time stamping it. Um, the total deaths back then were 279,000. And now we're, we, you know, we're looking. This is, remember, the John, Hop John Hopkins University uses confirmed data only. Yep. So everything you see there is it's not the live data coming through. I've actually seen some countries back off a thousand, you know, um, 
cases and then they climb back up to the, that thousand again over you know the next week um so the confirmed case is just crazy so so 369 versus 279 um back then 25 days ago uh recovered 1.3 million then now it's 2.5 million mm. and we're looking at a case fatality rate back then as this was developing still and i think mackie's right when he says that we'll see this you know um level out a bit later mm. on and hopefully it'll be as low as 9.35 i think whatever the um sars the original sars virus was mm. um but it's down to 12.6 now which is really good mm. yeah. i think we'll see that continue to level out and get down yeah. even lower but notwithstanding Mackie, the two craziest exponential countries with uh you know unabated increases exponential increases brazil and india are still exponential and uh, that's four hundred ninety-eight thousand uh for brazil and india and only 181 but i think we'll see more about that do you want to comment Mackie? yeah yeah look um it's actually it's funny dave put these numbers together fairly recently like a couple hours ago yep. right and, and already we only we're 34 people away from half a million for brazil yeah 34 people right yeah and um that's probably now india <laughs> yeah that's it's crazy it, it's it's it is uh it's scary now again in australia new zealand we're looking okay so far so good and the problem here of course is these are countries with massive populations. The US and Brazil, between them, have uh, half a billion people, mm. right? Russia, 145 million, right? Then the affected countries in Europe, UK, Italy, France, Germany, and so forth, you got another 200 million odd, okay? And then you got India, 1.3 billion. So mm. the top 10 countries, sorry, yeah, actually the top nine, I'm making the top 10, which is yeah. Turkey. Yeah including Turkey, it's only 84, 84 million. But between them, they have around, that's two billion, two and a half, yeah, about about three billion people between the, mm. so three billion people live in countries that are very badly affected by the coronavirus, just to put it in perspective. Now, can we believe the Chinese numbers? Uh, I don't think so. Really not. But if we, if we do not, that's another one and a half billion people so we're coming to close to five billion people we were at the majority of the human race is in close proximity of this outbreak and i'm not going to argue that if there's a virus like last week i'm not going to have that argument because yeah. i just don't know yeah. whatever it might be do your own research if you don't think there's a virus okay give send us send us the evidence and i've looked at all mm -hmm. there's a whole bunch of evidence that was there initially which has completely completely fallen apart yeah i'm not saying there isn't any merit to any of it but as far as the uh, outbreaks are concerned now here in countries that have absolutely no technological links <laughs> or just in the middle of nowhere or whatever, I think, it might I think be. I see what you're where you're going with that yeah. right so but just to be clear right again and even and I'm not arguing whether it's man-made or not man-made how it escaped was it an accident was it released was it an, you know who knows not touching that because none of that's no. found yet what is real though is, is is that these people are dying people are dying people are sick and the effect on the economy is also real right now could we argue that this was engineered yes we can absolutely mm -hmm. uh, do we want to uh, you know move more wealth from the uh, from the middle class and underclass to the upper class yeah probably i mean all of this all of what happened in the last 20 years was engineered that way you know and 9 11 the the the, uh, the financial crisis yeah right the, 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 everything that happened uh, had as a final consequence a massive redistribution of wealth from mm. the many, the many, many, many to the very few. And we, I think I shared this with you last week. But and it wasn't um, the poor people that got the money, was it, Mickey? Not, <laughs> there, not, not this time. Next time, Dave. Next I promise. Time. <laughs> Next time. Yeah. The check is in the mail. Yeah, um, right. but hold your breath. Hold your breath. <laughs> but um, but the My key thing here is to understand that the billionaires, right? Yeah, and uh, I can't remember the percentage here now, even the, the total number. But the top people in the world, from a wealth perspective, they actually made a lot of money in the last couple of months. They Isn't made a lot of money. Extraordinary! That was well, so extraordinary that I noticed. Yeah, I noticed the same thing. There's an old um, adage, uh, not really quite a saying. The uh, when there's blood in the streets, the buy real estate. The when there's blood in the streets. Buy real estate, and this is what this is. When you're down it's, so low. it's it's a massive crisis, right? Yeah. And um, and we have um, 
a lot of people losing their jobs. What happens if you lose your job? You might not be able to pay your mortgage. You might not be able to keep your house. Who could buy your house? Well, whoever's got money, right? So whatever businesses are going under, whatever the properties yeah. are being lost, somebody's uh, out there snapping it up. Because mm -hmm. this is the time, if you're cash rich, if you're loaded, right, and you're okay and you're, you're set up and that's all goodness, these kinds of situations, these scenarios, they're awesome for you. Buy low, this is sell what high, Mickey, that's the whole thing. Yeah. That's Absolutely. it. Arnie, Arnie was sitting in his pool, I remember a video on yeah. I come on Facebook, YouTube, uh, one of the platforms, doesn't really matter. And he's sitting there smoking his stogie and he was clearly sitting in a, in a, in a pool or a jacuzzi. You could see this deck in the back of him, a bit of a hedge in a, in a, in a wall. Mm -hmm. And, and <laughs> you know, this guy, not, nothing is hurting this guy. I'm not saying he didn't, he doesn't deserve what he has, right? Of course, he worked hard and all that, you know. Uh, but my point is, not everybody can live like Arnie. No, right? true. And he was berating people for not staying home. Now, I get that sentiment as well, but not everybody, and we said this many times before, is lucky enough to be able to stay home, work from home, mm. have food at home, not venture out to find a water, dirty water to drink. Yeah, that's, mm. that's, that's pretty hard, yeah. Mickey. I, 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 do, I do align myself with the thought that, you know, if, to be honest, and don't hate me for this, I, I, I get... I get I get, you know, you know, people talking to me on Facebook about it. If the government tells you to stay safe and do and behave in a certain way, you shouldn't argue that it's against your liberties to do it. You should take the advice, listen to it and understand what it truly means for you and for others and uh, try to obey it uh, rather than just, you know, outright fight it. <laughs> Fight it! It's my it's my liberty, Mickey, to to continue down the road despite the the warning sign that said the bridge is out. No, I don't care. I can I can uh, if in my reality that bridge is fine. Yeah. So I'm I'm going. I'll find and, out and, when and, I get and, there. Oh, and, and the sign was right. Good luck to you. Right. <laughs> good luck to you. Right. And, yeah. and... <laughs> oh, but but Dave is right though. It, You're I, right. I, look, um, this will this will segue really nicely. Um, with the amount of people that are that have been you know in lockdown and unemployed and really staring their their life's existence you know bang in the face and understanding where they are having this reality check of what what's really going on mm. in the world and then we come up with this is the first story mickey the um, mm. george floyd i feel so sorry for him, his family, uh, that I, the people who had to witness it, anyone who's seen the video, which I've seen, I feel sorry for anyone having to, to have, you know, but to it, recognize that, that there's a government that is doing, allowing this activity or not allowing it, or it's occurring and, and our humanity is being lost. But see, Dave, hold that thought for a second, because you said something very important. The people that had to witness it. Yeah. And that they were biased then, and, and thank God we're living in the age we're living in, and these things can be captured That's and then right. broadcast. Because if we lived in the 50s, this would have just been another black man's death. That's that right. That just would have been just a statistic. Don't know what happened. He, oh, he was resisting your arrest officer. Uh, uh, sorry, Sergeant. Oh, we, okay. That's okay. We have, we have four police officers that, yeah. you know, corroborate the story. Fine, Bingo. Done. But Despite this being is, a lot, right? Yeah. That's right? Oh, yeah, but exactly. But that's what would, what would have happened before we had these technolog uh, technological yeah. advantages, right? And it could be any minority. It doesn't have to be African-American. But the point I'm trying to make is this. So there were bystanders, right? And there were four police, police officers armed. I, I watched some of it. Hard to watch. It is hard to watch. Um, and um, if you're a bystander, and I'm, I'm, I'm not saying this to make anyone feel bad, right? But... Just put yourself in the, in the in the shoes of the bystanders. Could you have interfered? Let's say for argument's sake that mm -hmm. Dave and I had been standing there and we felt compelled to move, right? This, despite our best judgment, we were going to help that, that African-American on the ground mm -hmm. and that was held down by the policeman. So we would tackle him off the man. Do you know what yeah. happened? We would have got arrested. Or right? shot. Or shot. And, and, but he might have lived. George Floyd might have lived if we had done that. But nobody would be any the wiser because he right. didn't die. Who's the martyr you know? now? Who's no, the but, martyr now, man? Yeah, but that's that's but that's the thing though. That's my point, right? It's yeah. because it, it, we are at a, at a crossroads of morality, ethics, and and um, and the way how we should live with each other and be with each other. 
if you saw someone in distress, if these had been four dudes yeah. beating on another dude, right? I, I would be more inclined to assist that guy doing well, if that was the case, yeah. but police? Yes, police. <laughs> you know, you know that that you have no chance there. That's and right. It doesn't matter if you're if you're white or Asian yeah. or black or, yeah. or, or or you know Martian. It makes no difference at all if you interfere with four police officers arresting another person, mm -hmm. right? And this is and so whenever you see someone pulled up by the side of the road, and I want you to really put all our listenership out there, think about this. Yeah. If you see someone pulled up by the road, your immediate assumption is, oh yeah, okay, that that's legitimate. That's that's the thing mm. that the, the the police officer has every right to pull up that person, even though you don't know anything. You don't know anything about anything. You don't have the context. You don't know. That's your base assumption. That's right. right? Yep. For the most part, maybe not so much in America anymore, but but what do you do? Because you, because your instinct should be to help that person on the ground who's clearly in distress, but because of this this uniform and the authority this uniform wields in your mind, you don't. You don't interfere. This person is now dead. So, like I said, if someone had interfered, right, that person might be dead now, mm. right, or or arrested, and we wouldn't. We, this story wouldn't exist. We wouldn't be talking about it, no. right? Yeah. So, so this is when when it comes to these kinds of scenarios, doing the right thing will not be of any benefit to you. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Just as long, long as you understand it, and there won't be a story either necessarily, right? So this story is now huge. It's big, and and to be honest with you, we'll talk, we'll discuss this. And Dave has done an excellent job to to sort of structure it a little bit, but um, we'll Mickey, discuss it. One of on. those one of the things that I know you and I bring up all the time about this, and that is what you're willing to walk past and accept yes. Yes. should it happen to you those other people will walk past and accept it too yes so in your moral compass should be aligned such that at least you did something at least shout out i think i think you're actually killing a man would you just back off his, his neck right yeah was something yeah. i was yelling at the screen when i was watching it i would yeah. do the same thing in public yeah, and they did some some of the there were people did. doing that that's right yeah so so remember that it, you're you're willing to accept it if you walk past it and you're willing to accept it happen to you you know roles reversed if you do that and i think that's really hard the other one mecky is that anonymization of the police forces where yeah. they're becoming you know more militarized their equipment set is more military i know that they've got non-lethal weaponry that they carry on their person rather than simply the lethal weaponry mm. uh, and there's meant to be stages in which this is used there was three other police that watched it occur and, and I'll, I'll i'll just read the i'll read the story and because this is where it's gone to and i know everyone listening right now is completely aware that there is uh there's national guard being deployed but just let i'll just read it out because i've got it on the screen sure. So, it isn't the first time we've seen protests across America because of police using too much force against unarmed citizens occasioning death. Remember the poor fellow they dragged out of the car and beat to death? I forget, in LA, remember? Oh yeah, oh, I remember right? that, yeah, yeah. oh yeah. Uh, um, by day, this is, you know, this is a quote from a caller at a US TV station. And this is also echoed on a number of um, LA um, TV stations this afternoon that I will our time tonight, your time. Um, by day, the protests are helpful in getting their message across, but at night turn into rioting due to s suspected infiltrators from outside the counties, says a caller. Um, th that has been echoed across the land in the US. Yep. Look, I hope the ideal of to serve and protect is relearned as a result of this event by all the police of officers across the globe in order to eliminate their worsening oppressive behavior as seen all across social media. And now the reason why I say that is I understand that it takes a great deal of effort to restrain yourself when situations are no longer routine. So a routine traffic stop turns into something else, for instance, right? Um, this, these situations, the police are now pu more public than they've ever been. So, but when you have as 
uh, have seen as many hard to watch YouTube clips of innocent people being mistreated or killed for no reason. You have to ask yourself who's policing the police? What kind of governments yeah. governance yeah. is there? Yeah, it, yeah, look, Chris Custodius Ipsos Custodiet, right? Who yeah. guards the guardians? So this is a Roman, or this was Latin, so it's it's a Roman proverb. So this this problem is it's not yesterday's problem. It, this has been with us for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Who guards the guardians? Who polices the police? Who watches the watchers? Yeah. And the answer is nobody. The answer is there's actually a level where it stops. <clears throat> they're, they're meant to be oversights, internal affairs, etc., etc. But ultimately, in the act, on the street, uh, in any given situation, there's no one there that is beyond the police. So the police come in to deal with whatever situation, but there's no one that comes in to deal with the police at that point, mm -hmm. if you if you get my meaning. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Dave, you, you said something very interesting, the, military, the increased militarization of the police force globally, in fact. Yep. We say this uh, now very much at play in Hong Kong, and we're gonna talk about that in a second. And uh, we say it in play in other places of the world. And it's, it's really pitting the, the police against the citizenry. And I don't think that uh, we will change Sorry, we, I don't think we'll see a change in attitude. What I, what, I, what I think will happen, worst case scenario, in my opinion, is we, see, we will see a garrisoning of the police force. What do I mean by that? So, so, so in the olden days, um, they, they, there were little places called garrisons, little fortresses or castles or whatever it might be, like strongholds, mm -hmm. where the, let's call it the police force of the day was held. Maybe usually like they're you know, the, the, the soldiers, but they're garrisoned outside and away from the citizens or citizenry or people or populations they were controlling or guarding yeah? or policing as it were mm -hmm. but away from them in fact completely away they're living away from them their food supply was away from them it was all they're living in their own little world in the garrison i can see that kind of thing happening more and more as we have more and more gated communities as we have more and more people living in slum like conditions mm -hmm. you know disenfranchised where the rich will ask for police forces oh, to yes, be in their communities. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, there are now schools in America, maybe elsewhere in the world, but I know for a fact in America, that have police stations inside the school. Wow. There are police stations in high schools, right? There's like a, like a, <laughs> it's like, I mean, I was astounded when I found out about this. So the, and what the garrisoning will do, and this is really to your question, Dave, it will create an us and them mentality. Mm -hmm. and. Not that it doesn't exist, no, but really what, what should happen is protect and serve, right? Protect and serve, like Dave said, that's the that's the um, uh, uh, job for the police. That's it. Protect and serve where they can. Not control and oppress and kill in, in the worst yeah. case scenario, yeah, yeah. which is what we're seeing. But we are seeing a militarization. We're seeing a, a brutalization of the police force. I'm not saying it's an easy job. It's a hard job. Mm. It's a hard job. But we've got to be real careful that we go, don't go down a road where it will be us and them, where the police force will see itself as completely separate from the rest of the of the citizenry, right? And and, and I'm not saying that's 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 uh, here now. I'm fearing though that it may become something in the future. Yeah, Dave? yeah, completely. Look, my father was a police officer, and uh, he said that it the whole thing changed. They didn't wear; they just wore clothes. They wore regular, you know, non-bullet-stopping, non-armoured clothing, and they had a, a pistol, a nightstick, and a set of handcuffs. That was it. So yeah, and you remember in, fact, in England? Yeah, in in England, they've actually stripped the police of weapons. Yeah, that's Just all they have is a stick. Yeah, and the amount of times that the English police officers or bobbies um, will actually talk someone down rather than using lethal force is is a, it's it's so pleasurable to watch that occur because mm. you go you, in fact words words can solve a lot of these problems they can bring people down from a point where they were going to you know do something wrong hurt themselves or others or yep. whatever the story yep. is yep. and yep. They, they they can then be looked after rather than well you're on the other side of a fence that i I police the board, the boundary of, and it's since you're over there, I can just shoot you. Yeah. Right. And that's really bad. I, I really have a hard time with that. So historically, um, how have the majority of police police never been charged with murder, or is is it our system that lets them off now? Because 
uh, you know, you hear, you know, a, a death in custody and there's an inquiry and, and the police officer's charged. And then when it gets to court, they're dismissed. Mm -hmm. The case is dismissed or something. And I think that's really hard. If that was to play out in this case, I don't think the protest and rioting would be the end. I think my belief is that th that would escalate this far beyond the, where, what we're seeing today. Look, and that, that's exactly the, right. The and family, in fact... even the family of the, the victim said yeah. the, the rioting and the protest one, that's fine, protest, mm, mm. And, and remember this fellow, George Floyd, right? Well, yeah. But don't and, riot because and... you're changing the message, you're changing the whole thing. But see, this is this is not about George Floyd. No, <clears throat> and we, we spoke about this um, um, last week. You know the uh, origins of World War One, World War Two, mm -hmm. any conflict. It's always a pretext. It's a cork that was popped. It's the straw that broke the camel's back. It's mm -hmm. it's it's an it's a trigger. It's a trigger event. Are people angry at at uh, this particular uh, uh, this this particular wrongful death? The answer is yes. It's mm -hmm. murder, really. If you think, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't care if it's third degree or first degree murder. It's murder. A person did something actively, actively, not by accident. This was not an accident. He didn't, the, the, the policeman didn't fall on George Floyd, right? He had him down on the ground. I mean, the guy's on the ground with with his hands cuffed behind his back it anyway. What, it was where's he no going to go? That, that kind of no. force is no longer required. No, his his neck, sorry, his, his knee was on his, his whole body weight was on his neck. Yeah. On this guy's neck. I mean, okay, but look, I'm getting angry because it is an angry thing. Um. And I've been in positions like this. So if you're doing martial arts, you, you get into chokeholds, and it's not pleasant. It's scary, even if yeah. you're in a controlled environment. It's still scary. It's terrifying. Um, but but the point here is that it it is it is it is never something that can be handled by an authority because people are not held to account, Dave. Right? That's that's mm. really the issue here. People aren't being held to account because if they were. And this is also the problem that we had with the, um, I guess, the illegal killings in, in uh, theaters of war, Afghanistan, Iraq, yeah, Iran, right. wherever, World War yeah. II, right? War, war crimes, whatever. If you start holding people to account, you will then no longer have an effective police force. You will no longer have what you want in your mind, right? So it's the, the control of us. Because the police officers, they, they, won't, they won't put themselves in harm's way if they think that they're going to get prosecuted. That's right. Why would they? No. Right, I mean, I'm not saying this is generally true for everybody, but but then you've got these extremes. Like, I mean, and George Floyd doesn't happen every day, no, either. But but again, it's a trigger event, right? So in fact, nobody really cares about George Floyd, right? I mean, not nobody, not, not except for his family and his friends. Nobody knows George Floyd. It's just a guy, and he became a symbol. This guy was killed, That's right? right? He wasn't he wasn't a Martin Luther King. He wasn't a JFK. He wasn't a big figure. He was just a, a regular guy that was killed in a police confrontation. Well, I, I wouldn't even call it that it's not a in a police yeah, action yeah, because right. yeah, 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 because he didn't really come any. So, so it's a trigger event, and now a lot of anger that has been sitting under the lid, mm. a lot of festering, resentment bubbling up. It's been festering. This is this is a release valve because mm. I mean, here I am. I'm angry all day, and I don't know what to do with my anger. I might beat my wife, or you know, maybe I drink, maybe I do drugs. But I've got this anger in me, right? I lost my job. I don't have a future. I can't see where my kids are gonna, you know, succeed. I just yeah. don't. My neighborhood is falling yeah. apart, right? And it, and it's pulling oh. the rug from beneath you, and and yeah. the whole civilization is topsy turvy yeah. now, right? And there he is. He's now okay. George Floyd. He was killed. Oh, I'm angry about that. Now all my anger that was there already, I can now have. I have an. I have a target for my anger. Yeah. And some people also. And this is a int uh, intimated here. Mm -hmm. Will use this as an excuse, Dave. Yeah. yeah. They will go. And, and take advantage, right? It, how, how does looting and protesting go hand to hand? So protesting is you saying, hey, enough is enough. Let's do something here. I don't like it. I don't like the system. Hold people to account. Let's do it. Right? And bringing people and saying, police. when do we want yeah. it now? Yeah. Get, that's and, a great, uh, great charge. And you can have a 10, yeah. 10 million people walking sure. you know, to the capital demanding that that happens, right? Yeah. But I mean, he was only charged with manslaughter, to be honest. And yeah. um, and the yeah. coroner even talked it down. Yeah. Well, they said he didn't intend to kill him. M murder in the third degree in the American yeah, system, right. meaning kill somebody. It is murder, yes, but you didn't set out to murder them. 
that, that, that's right. right. So, so manslaughter was... is, a, is a, yeah. a reasonable charge for that. Yeah. Um, well, look, you can argue that though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, that, that's but true. That, look, but the, the burning burning down shops and cars and, and, and police stations for that matter and, and then taking looting stores that that is not a protest that is a riot it is a riot and and we're now seeing things that are riots it's it's a it's it's a reality right um and um i tell you there's some things that are being said here which are not um ideal i mean trump said when the shooting starts the looting starts he does. He said he had no idea. He heard it many times. I, I tell you where it came from. But this is really why I've got a problem with him saying this. Because I mean, I mean, uh, I got nothing against the guy, but saying it in this context, and you you you, you might as well throw oil on a fire. All right. So, so where, where did it come from, Mickey? So in 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 late 1967, right? Um, uh, um armed robberies, unrest, and so forth gripped uh, black neighborhoods in Miami. All right. Now the city's white police chief, who was a you know a, a tough talking. Um, former U.S. Army Cavalry officer, right? He held a news conference, and I've got a picture of him here. I'm looking at him. He looks like a bulldog. He, and he was declaring war on criminals, okay? The police um, chief, Walter Hadley, warned, his name was uh, Walter Hadley, would use shotguns at dogs at his command, okay? And what he said was this, I've let the word filter down that when the looting starts, the shooting starts, Hadley said. Hmm. In 1967, right? Amongst what could be described race riots, if you will. Yeah. And then Trump, in his ignorance, uttered the very same phrase that Walter Hadley uttered in 1967. Wow. When the looting starts, the shooting starts. Yeah, well, Okay? Not yeah. very bright. Uh, we've got 15 minutes to go, and I want to say that, that Donald Trump uh, tweeted today, the National Guard has been released in Minneapolis to do the job that the Democrat mayor couldn't do. Should have been used two days ago, and there would not have been damage, and police headquarters would not have been taken over and ruined. Great job by the National Guard. No games. Mm. The no games part at the end. What, was he just filling the amount of tweet space he had? Yeah. No, he, I don't, th I think, look, protesting is one thing, uh, rioting and looting is another, and mm. uh, I, I think that's pretty pretty bad. Look, my question, Mackie, and, and I know mm. you have the right answer for this, and <laughs> as we're watching now the National Guard being released, uh, Minneapolis, o Ohio, Seattle, Kentucky, LA City, uh, they've announced curfews and one of the curfews was announced 10 minutes before it was applicable mm -hmm. and he had 10 minutes to get home wherever mm -hmm. they were right mm -hmm. um and I, I i was originally going to ask this was hours ago will this spread across the nation but i think it's that's already answered itself but my real question here is how long before the national guard and the curfew turns into martial law yeah, it's, it's a whole different kettle of fish. Uh, my wife's sister lives in Seattle, and they've got a 5 p.m. curfew in that city now, right, with the riots going on. So it's it's, it's a real thing. I, we, I, it's, it's affecting. I mean, if you've got any friends or family over there in, in the States, then it'll touch you. But, uh, Dave, uh, right now, yes, National Guard is, is deployed. Any any crisis or emergency situation, can national uh, any state governor or, or uh, any other similar official can call the National Guard. It's, mm. an, it's a state action. Mm. It's a state action, right? Uh, martial law is not a state action. Martial law is a federal action, as far as I understand it, mm. which means it, it, be, it'll be, uh, it has to be sanctioned uh, by the federal government. Happy to be corrected on this. But martial law cannot be called by, by a person locally. Ne emergency, National Guard, yes, all that. But once you call martial law, because martial law is a whole different thing. So, so curfew, and under, under a national emergency, even curfews, normal rights still exist the bill of rights and all of that still the constitution all of that exists under martial law it doesn't under martial law there's no longer any constitutional protection there's so no it's, longer it's any like war against your people no well it, it is it's war. using it's using your federal troops or yes. your national troops in a federal way yes. across your states yeah so so martial law is the last thing you want. And there was actually a movie made, uh, um, and Bruce Willis was, uh, was in it. I can't remember the name of the movie, but uh, <laughs> it, it was some kind of 
some, some kind of terrorist attack, and Denzel Washington was in it as well. And I can't really remember what it was called. But the FBI was uh, attacked. Um, FBI headquarters in New York were blown up. And they, they're calling martial law. So they're bringing in um, troops. They suspended the habeas corpus and posse commentators, you know, and all that. And, and they brought in uh, 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 regular army forces into New York to, uh, to enforce martial law. And they were torturing and killing people. And you know what? That was okay under martial law. Is it the right thing to do? No, it's not. But martial law is exactly what it sounds like. It is the law that you have in a war or warlike situation. Everything else is suspended. People can be summarily executed under martial law. People can be detained and tortured under martial law. Mm. Every other right that you think you had is gone. Right. Yeah, Will this right. happen? Well, look, if, if, I mean, they burn down a police station for crime. I mean, if this gets worse and you now have people in the street with weapons, right? And it becomes so much the police and even the National Guard can't handle it anymore. Then, yeah, martial law may very well be called in the States. But if that happens, right, it's a very slippery slope and a very short ramp yeah. into secession and civil war. Mm. right? Is it, is it likely? No. But it's possible, especially now, especially with the overall situation. I mean, economically, it's depressed. You do have a lot of veterans out uh, out mm. of work, a lot of and, homeless and people, a lot of gun ownership, as well. a lot of gun That's ownership, right. Yeah. right? You've got the virus still wreaking havoc, so mm. there's this chaos there. So there's this a whole bunch of of. Well, I'm I'm thinking of Pandora's box here, right, yeah, Dave? Right. To be honest with you, yeah, it's yeah. open and, and all the crud has bubbled out of it, my friend. <laughs> but let me ask you this, though. Yeah, what's that? Um, I mean, you can, of course, comment on this, but I, after that, I'd like you to understand how you feel about um, um, what would happen if the police officers hadn't been found guilty of manslaughter, right? So to, to tell me what you think about this, uh, well, about the uh, martial law, but what, what if they hadn't been found guilty of manslaughter? Well, they haven't been found guilty. They should have been charged with manslaughter. Sorry, right? charged. Let's say, right. they let's say, you know. So so what if, what if he, they dropped the case? Yeah. That's, I, yeah, right? We're looking at um, a government that's going to be in fear of a reprise from the people, for sure. Absolutely faux show, right? That is going to happen. I can't see America sitting idle if, if, those, if this police officer um, in particular, the one who was kneeling, um, was found innocent or they they just simply dropped the charges that would be the end i think you know, mickey if there was any country in the world right now that would benefit from this or you know rub their hands together sort of you know like mr burns excellent right mm -hmm. it, it would if you let's just pretend i know we've only got six minutes right and we probably won't cut touch the other things uh, so much uh but if, if it were the case and there was a, a, a country who'd engineered a virus and was spreading. This would just be icing on the cake. Oh, completely. Oh, I'd, you'd, I'd be having parties if I was the evil guy that lived in a volcano, right? <laughs> if I designed this. Mm. There'd be a, there'd be an all-night dance party or something. I don't know. But, Mickey, I've got to say, I've got to say, um, the US uh, with the virus and cutting its... You know ties with the who uh, not just funding but ties entirely and now has announced that it's withdrawing trade ties with hong kong and also going to tear up or delete its special privileges as far as trade was concerned or you know those things that are outside of the trade or add-ons they're all going to get deleted now and and i find that a really a really strong position that the us is is taking and you know for me <coughs> china's in the sights right oh look uh, there's no doubt obviously now uh, china is taking the initiative in hong kong um you know to go and, and bring in this um law which which effectively does does uh, end hong kong's special status within china mm -hmm. hong kong was pretty much left alone but you have to understand when china took on hong kong yeah. it accounted for 30 percent that was back in 99, I think. 30% mm -hmm. of the Chinese economy was Hong Kong. That's right. 30%. Today, it's 3%. Yeah, I was going to say Hong 5 or something. Yeah. yeah. It's actually, yeah, it's 3. I did the, I, yeah. I looked it up. Yeah, good. But, uh, but um, 
that that gives you an idea as to why Hong Kong was left alone for so long and why the Chinese now feel they don't really have to do that anymore, right? But of course, the knock-on effects are much, much, much bigger than a simple economic uh, a gain here um, and negative Im impact here. And, and because Hong Kong, similar to, I guess, Macau and Singapore, is seen as an easy entry into Asia. And Hong Kong specifically, it's an easy port entry into doing trade with uh, China, which is still somewhat closed off and hard to do business with unless you are native and Absolutely. you speak the lingo. Mm -hmm. So they're shooting themselves in the foot, uh, for, for starters, by, by doing this to Hong Kong. And they're not making it any easier on Taiwan to, to you know, because they, they always claim that Taiwan or Formosa yeah. is, is part of China. And the, the Taiwanese are looking at Hong Kong going, no, thank you very much. That's right. I don't need that. that <laughs> right? Taiwan has also said we'll take all the Hong Kong ease. Everyone mm -hmm. who lives in Hong Kong that yeah. doesn't want to live under that will have them. No dramas. But I think what that's going to mean, Mackie, is that they're going to come under the the allies um, group of countries, no doubt. But let's let's unpack in this just for way, a second, right? Yeah, we do have a few moments, and, and we, I'm happy to. Well, we can go on the, in the second hour. We can, mm -hmm. yeah, no, we can. In the second hour, we can do a little bit of this. And uh, but let's unpack it. I mean, the thing is this: so Hong Kong, oh, sorry, China can now be tough on Hong Kong, maybe even tough on. Uh, on uh, Taiwan, especially if America is in the grip of the, pan of the pandemic and in the grip of civil unrest. So those two things will distract America mm -hmm. from um, becoming too involved overseas because it just won't, it, it wouldn't be a venture that anybody would support, not the Senate, not Congress, right? And not the people. Mm -hmm. uh, but the relationship to watch here now is India and China because that is bad at the best of times. Frictions are massive between the two, right? You think Pakistan and India are natural enemies. India and China really, mm. really don't get along. Yeah, well, I, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I, watch, I watch a hater of China, an Indian lady newsreader. Yeah, no. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I'm not saying her name, I'm not going to support her, but um, I and, and she's she's like the tip of that iceberg. Yeah. Um, yeah. So look, the, the only other thing that I had to mention was um, that the UK has declared 10 countries that will create 5G technology to avoid the reliance on Huawei, um, mm -hmm. says Boris Johnson in a, res, uh, a recent press release. And he said that India, Australia, South Korea, France, Canada, Germany, Japan, Italy, the US and UK are those 10 countries that are going mm -hmm. to try to work to recreate that technology. Yeah, makes sense. Wow. Look, uh, the situation is, is bad, but not hopeless. Um, and But you see, like in any any um, crisis situation in the past, if you're a student of history, you see you get a perfect storm and things just line up. Mm -hmm. and, and we're lining ourselves up for a perfect storm here. Yeah. Um, I just do, I hope that people with calmer heads and cooler tempers prevail, but uh, you never know, right? Because <laughs> um, right? Because right now, you drink well, Marge. I know, I know. But <laughs> so, you're looking at you yeah. look at the world leaders that all of almost all the world leaders in, in you know not all of them but almost all are, are completely the wrong people for this time, completely the wrong people That's for this right. kind of crisis. Yeah, you know? I know, I know. And look, just just for the last minute, look, I, last night I, this morning our time, I watched that su successful SpaceX launch of um, two astronauts uh, being sent to uh, the ISS uh, and they were using the Dragon capsule on a Falcon 9 rocket platform and they left from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. It was flawless. And mm. Mackie, the, the tech they've got, they've got three large, like, you know, 42 centimeter screens, touch screens in front of them and they're yeah, operating that. And I saw a comparison to, you know, 1967. Cheapest contractor. <laughs> He's even got an iPad and they're wearing, you know, uh, wrist bound technology on their arms as well. So they've got their own controls plus an iPad or equivalent platform ta tablet plus these screens. Oh, uh, what a simplistic thing that they've got going on. It looks terribly complicated, like all the things they can touch. But those gloves, they get impressed with they can use those gloves to use the touch screen. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, the, the military gloves. I was going to buy some. The uh, the fingertips are sensitive, is all especially sensitized for you to use the um, the touch screens these wow. days. Wow, uh, I still I want to pull like, put a call out. I'm, I was interested in some night vision, uh, hmm. maybe Gen three. So if anyone's got stereo, uh, not monocular, but stereo or binocular, I'd like to uh, just talk to me about it. Um, 
so it's been a, a crazy week. I, I hope that anyone living in the US is going to abide by the rules now in your in your area. Maybe those looters were doing um uh well, there's the music, but the looters were looting in, in Beverly Hills. Yeah, I know. It wasn't even right. food. If it was food, I'd, I'd understand. Yeah. I, like the, I need the latest Versace sneakers. <laughs> I'm starving for attention. <laughs> yeah. like, stay tuned. Uh, after the, the short break, we'll be back. <laughs> With David Mecky Shiny Side Out on freedomslips.com on the number one listener supporter talk radio on the net. So push the donate button or subscribe to the archives for only $5 US a month. If you're new to Shiny Side Out, welcome aboard. This is a tinfoil hat zone. So keep your arms within the vehicle, turn off your personal reality inverters. I love that Mecky quote. I just love that. <laughs> and please, no flash photography. We're glad you're on board and thank you for inviting us into your lives to so follow, subscribe or otherwise for the appropriate social media platform. We are halfway through show number 428. And 20 and 400. Oh, <laughs> I've, got, I've got a whole bunch of people now that hate me for that. Terrible. <laughs> Terrible, terrible. Uh, okay, so get some merchandise from the station's website, maybe an EMP proof thumb drive or survival documents in included, or a seat pack or whatever it is, but just be sure to understand and um, your local importing laws. In Australia, we can't import seeds, no. viable, healthy seeds. We're not allowed to. Um, because if they're treated, then they're killed. So, yeah, good luck yeah. with that. Um, but Mackie, um, mm. cr crazy, just crazy, crazy, crazy. Uh, you know, I've met more people, Mackie, that listen to our show. Two, two more. Yeah, two more. <laughs> another, another <laughs> one. <laughs> the, the one that we have now. Two total. All right. <laughs> you can start a fan club soon. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and I've set up, I've set some, I've got a, like a merch thing now, so I can click and produce a page that shows all of our merch, mm. which is really interesting. Very cool. And um, if you'd like any of those, just go to Zazzle. Um, Zazzle's good. The merch, the merch is there. Uh, Coffee we, cups are good. Yeah, Obviously. the cups are really good. So I've got a 20 ounce, Mackie, 20 ounce coffee cup. That's not enough, right? No, it's not. You're going to have two of those. I need more coffee than just that. Just to wake up. Um, and look, if you've got any ideas, let us know. Happy yeah. to do those. All right. Um, and just so that everybody knows well, I, I am working on a couple of articles, which I hope to publish somewhere. Uh, one is about the moon and another one is about something else. Uh, <laughs> we'll see when that's done. Uh, but uh, there's enough research now that we've done that we can actually put these articles out there. And, and it's the first time that I've seen anything like it in one place. So every show that we do, we bring together a lot of research, obviously, right? <laughs> From all over the place. And none of, I mean, you know, I, I would never claim that any of it is all ours. <clears throat> you know, some of the conclusions, certainly some of the opinions, certainly are ours. But the research was done solidly by a whole bunch of other people out there. And, and we always give them credit. Our show notes <clears throat> have all the sources mm -hmm. and all the credits in there as well. We would never dream of, uh, of, of, of taking uh, any of these uh, items for ourselves. Uh, that's just stupid. So we, we're standing on, on the shoulders of, of massive uh, researchers to paraphrase. Sure. Uh, fellow scientists out there in the world, you know, we we stood on the so shoulders of Big giants shoulders. to get where we are. Yeah, yeah, and and look, some of them have passed away as well, which is uh, you know always a tragedy. But uh, even more so in our field, where good researchers uh, that really just wanted just the truth. That's all. Right? I don't. I have no, there's no agenda, no platform. I just want to know the truth. That's few and far between, right? And we've lost quite a few of those in, in the last couple of years. We've interviewed but, a few. Oh no, we were lucky. Yeah, super lucky. I mean, a lot of these interviews were <clears throat> dreams for me come true. Likewise. People I had admired, you know, for, for a long time. Um, but yeah, we were privileged. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and again, thanks, Dave, for giving me that call one day. I remember it was a Tuesday night, maybe Wednesday night, who knows? But 
said, do you want to be on the radio, Mickey? <laughs> yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> what does that mean? Um, well, here you we found are. out pretty quick. And just like the Rolling Stones, yeah, at the good. end of their first year, when interviewed, Mick Jagger goes, well, you know, um, uh, I, hope, I hope maybe, like, who knew we were going to get this far? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, no. very That's funny stuff. It is. It is. It's also, you know, humbling. But look, just on that though, um, yeah, we, we, we are uh, more than just the, the radio show, which is, uh, of course, that was uh, definitely our platform, but you can, you can find us on the net as well. Get in touch. Is there anything that you wanted to discuss or research or have, have brought up in a show? There are a couple of things we don't touch. Uh, I won't say what they are because no. that means touching them. Uh, but if, if you're suggesting them, then I do apologize in advance that I will not touch them. I won't go near it um, for various reasons, and mostly because I'm terrified. That's that's the reason. <laughs> Dave, have you, you can have your, your, like a solo show one day if you want to touch those oh, no. items. No, no, I'll be I, sick that Sunday. I, I, <laughs> I've, I've already been warned by one group that I'm not to talk about a specific topic in which I'll never talk about it, ever. And that's fine, and we won't, unless Happy. it's already out there in the, uh, on the internet. You get, well, yeah, if there's some page out there on some internet somewhere that we can read directly from the text, it's not my opinion then. That's right. Okay. And look, and that's that's really what it is. Yeah. But the, the other the other topic I would never dream to bring up, even reading it from a from a page on the internet, never will I talk about that. <laughs> um, now, without further ado, though, um, I'm glad that's are, clear. I know, right? Yeah. It's mud. Come come into my mud bath <laughs> and come and <laughs> bubble. Hey. Um, why is the bubbles? You? This is this is not the spa. <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, long. Hey, uh, think, think about that one for a second. We we were talking about ancient tech, and we're talking about a special case. Didn't quite finish it, and I would I do want to finish it in the last section. Then I want to throw it to Dave for something even more astounding than what I'm going to share with you right now. We did talk about this last time. So we, the special case we talked about was um, pretty much stonework. Or working with stone, working in stone, having stone monuments, megaliths, you know, a thousand ton megaliths uh, being transported, etc. So, and this 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 piece here that we um, almost finished uh, is called long distance megaliths. And and the way they look at these long distance and uh, massive uh, megaliths, you know, single single uh, stones, uh, are pieces of places. Meaning maybe these builders brought them somewhere because they wanted a piece of the place where they took it from to be in the new place. Just a theory, right? And look, there's some extraordinary accounts of unfeasibly large stones being moved over unnecessarily. That's the key word here. Long distances, suggesting that either the location or the stone itself were considered to have special properties. In my opinion, both. I think both the stones and the locations they were transported to and from were special. Stonehenge. Over 80 blue stones moved over 250 miles from Preseli in Wales. In Giza, Egypt, 50 plus ton, so in, ex in excess of 50 ton granite stones transported over 300 miles from Aswan. Why not just build it in Aswan, <laughs> right? <laughs> Karnak, 300, 300 plus ton. The Lok Marika men here is transported over 25 miles. Karnak, that's in France. Olan Tiambo, sorry, Olan Tatambo, 50 plus again ton rocks, periphery uh, stones, in fact, transported seven miles. But the seven miles might not be impressive that they had to go over 6,000 meter high mountains and valleys is. So you're not moving seven miles in a straight line. You're moving seven miles going up 6,000, mm. down 6,000. Tia Tihuanaco. The most famous one, I would probably suggest, 90 square feet sheets of mica. 90 square sheet wow. feet of mica. That, that, that is, that's a big sheet of mica. And Transport it's fragile. It's fragile. Oh, it's, it's fragile. Transported over the controversial distance of two... Th <laughs> controversial because they think it wasn't done. 2,000 kilometers. Mm -hmm. Now, what does this tell us? Any more than they wanted stone from one place to be taken to another. Well, in each case, there must have been a large and available workforce, including skilled and unskilled laborers, support, organizers, all presumably under the authority of an individual or caste or group. Such structures can be deemed as social constructions and lend weight to Mendelssohn's theory of large monuments and stones as symbols of greatness. 
Assuming one of the prerequisites of construction being the use of large stones, why then select to move such large blocks of stone over such long distances, when other more local and readily available sources were known, as was certainly the case at Stonehenge? Although it is arguably obvious that the granite used in the Egyptian pyramids was structural, the same cannot be said of all sites. Noticeably, the 90 feet or the 90 square feet mica sheets of Teotihuacan, which were found sandwiched between stone layers of uh, stone and which were ser which served no apparent structural or aesthetic function. So these mica sheets were sandwiched between s layers of stone, really, right? But why? What for? It made no sense. It doesn't actually serve a purpose. It was, it was the architect's design, Mickey. Needed clearly. <laughs> Ah, but I mean, yeah, look, but that's it. You're right. Stones transport over long distances to build megaliths. Like I said earlier, they have been described as pieces of places, right? So, so maybe they did want a piece of that particular place in the new place. The logistic difficulties involved with the long distance transportations suggest that the stone itself was considered to have qualities worth transporting, right? Especially over such extreme distances. However, the very fact that stones were transported so far also suggests that the new location itself must have been of equal importance to the builders. Okay, like I said earlier, the place came from, the material itself, and the new place were all equally important. At Valle de Rodrigo in southern Portugal, geological analyses were carried out at the stones used in four megalithic graves. The results were surprising as the stones had been brought to the site from different locations up to off up to 10 kilometers distance. Geological research suggests that this choice was probably predominantly motivated by functional and practical reasons. As different rocks had different appearances and physical characteristics, it is suggested that they were chosen according to a preconceived design. In addition, the locations of the sites of origin of the different material represents main celestial directions from the megaliths. This makes it likely that the monuments also represent certain symbolic values associated with the landscape and certain cosmologies. Now, the transportation of specific stone over long distances suggests one of two things, or maybe both. One, the type or location of stone was more important than the extra labor incurred in transporting it. Two, the location of the monument was more important than extra work required to move the stone. Mm. It is interesting to note that one of the common factors that these long haul megaliths um, is that they were invariably composed of granite, or more precisely quartzite which was the leading choice of stone around the prehistoric world. Noticeably in areas such as Neolithic Europe, early dynastic Egypt, and pre-Columbian America, and as we found out in some places in Asia as well. This prejudice to quarry, cut, and haul one of the hardest family of rocks in cases of hundreds of miles, whilst ignoring more locally available sources, is a clear suggestion that the qualities of the granite itself were important to the megalithic builders, Dave. Mm. Oh, a, a, apart from being particularly hard, stone granite has several other physical properties which may have been recognised by their ancient masons. Um, Correct. Oldest obsidian bracelet reveals amazing craftsman skills in the 8th millennium BC. Researchers from the Institut Francais de Tours uh, Anatolanes, Latinans, in Istanbul, that's a surprise, I thought it'd be French, but that's right, and the uh, laboratory of, oh, I don't know whether that'd be uh, Tribology, uh, and the dynamics of systems, have analysed the oldest obsidian bracelet ever identified, discovered in the 1990s at the site of the Asikli Hayuk, Turkey, using high-tech methods developed by LTDS to study the bracelet's surface and its microtopographic features, the researchers have revealed the astounding technique, sorry, technical expertise of craftsmen in the 8th millennium BC. Their skills were highly sophisticated for this period in late prehistory, 
and on a par with today's polishing techniques. This work is published in the December 2011 issue of Journal of Archaeological Science and sheds new light on Neolithic societies which remain highly mysterious. Dated to 7500 BC, the obsidian bracelet studied by the researchers is unique. It is the earliest evidence of obsidian working, which only reached its peak in the 7th and 6th millennia BC, with the production of all kinds of ornamental objects, including mirrors and vessels. It has a complex shape and a remarkable central annular ridge and is 10 centimeters in diameter and 3 centimeters or 3.3 centimeters wide. Discovered in 1995, the exceptional site of Asikli Hulk in Turkey is uh, and displayed ever since at the Aksare Archaeological Museum. The ring was studied in 2009 after. Oh my, can you do that one, Mickey? Mary Ban Ospasaran. A professor at the University of Istanbul's Department of Prehistory resumed excavations. Lawrence Astruk, a CNRS researcher, and her colleagues analyzed the bracelet using extremely powerful computer technologies developed by LTDS researchers in Hassan Zahune. Um, E N I S E and Roberto uh, E C L um, developed for industry in order to characterize the orange peel effect on painted car bodywork, and I'm I know what that exact thing means. It looks like orange peel, but it's uh, spray paint. <laughs> Hence the name. <laughs> I know, right? But people go, Crazy. "Wow, you got the orange peel effect." No, that just says terrible spray painting. Uh, <laughs> how'd you do that no oh, i'm just really bad at it um these methods said so that was used in vehicle manufacturing is what their resulting developed industry was uh, these methods known as multi-scale uh tribological analysis has been adapted for the study of micro topographic features on archaeological artifacts they seek to identify every single operation performed on the surface of these objects. I'm just going to give you a hint. If you sand a surface with 2000 grit and then 1500 grit and then 1000 grit and then, sorry, the other way around, 800 and you get up to 2000 or 2500 two and grit uh, from really coarse to really fine, you should be able to see some tell cell telltale signs of all of those if you've not done it perfectly. So this process that they're using here has revealed that the bracelet was made using highly specialized manufacturing techniques. The, so the analysis carried out showed that the bracelet was almost perfectly regular. The symmetry of the central annular ridge is extremely precise. To the nearest degree and nearest hundredth micrometers, this suggests that the artisans of the time used models to control its shape when it was being made. The surface finish of the bracelet, which is very regular, resembling a mirror, required the use of complex polishing techniques capable of attain, obtaining a nanometer scale surface quality worthy of today's telescope lenses. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Led by Lawrence Astruk, the work was carried out in collaboration with the University of Istanbul and was funded by France's National Research Agency as part of the Obsidian Practical Techniques and Uses in Anatolia program, the ANR 08 Blanc 0318. In the program, the <laughs> Asikli Hayuk bracelet is the first object to have been studied among some 60 other polished obsidian artifacts. In collaboration with the University of Manchester and the British Museum, Lawrence Astruk's team is now analysing ornamental objects found at the Halif sites in Domus Tepe in eastern central Anatolia and, oh, good on you, can you do that in Iraq? 
Alpakia. Alpakia. Thank you. Mackie. Crazy. So, so look, what this shows, and then we're going to come in, in a second, we come what it tells us about the ancient stone workers, but what it shows us that these, these people, um, 10,000 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. Between 10 and between 10 and 15,000 years ago, thereabouts, that's that's where we put most of these things, uh, had extraordinary capabilities to work with stone. Not not just, and so this is the reason we, we bring you these two examples here, I guess, to, to is to highlight, they were very comfortable working with several hundred tons worth of granite, up to 1,200 tons, 1,200 tons worth of granite as a block, mm -hmm. right? They could quarry it, they move it, and they put it pretty much wherever they wanted. We know they did because they did it, mm -hmm. right? You look at the uh, the base of the Temple of Jupiter in Baalbek, there it is. No one can, because it was done, there it is. But on the other scale, Dave, and, and but but it's okay, but it also showed an extreme amount of precision. Not only were they big, and they, and roughly hewn, no, not at all. They were finely uh, machined. Right, mm -hmm. the the sarcophagus in the in, in in the Great Pyramid, other stone works. When you look at the massive walls, there, I mean, there the, there's no mortar between these blocks. They're fitted together seamlessly with with multi angles, multi angled stones, and they all fit together perfectly. So not only could they work with very large, heavy stones, but they could work with them on a very precise scale. And not only that, they could work with really, really small scale objects, like mm. a bracelet or, or rings. But it was machined to the same level of precision, if not more so. We're talking about nanometer scale surface polishing mm -hmm. that we do today for telescope lenses. Let's take a step back here. And ask the question, why? <laughs> we need it for the telescopes. Makes perfect sense why we do it, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the more perfect the lens, the better uh, a, a picture you get. I mean, to put it simply, right? I mean, the, the, the better your observational power of that particular telescope, you know, the, the better the quality of the light that comes through it to give you an image, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes perfect sense to have a really well-made lens. This is a bracelet, Dave. Who cares? Oh, it's a good bracelet, Mickey. But <laughs> it's, 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 it's an astounding good. bracelet. Yes. But but think about the, the work required. And not only that, I don't know if you guys know obsidian. So obsidian is volcanic glass. That's what obsidian is. Mm -hmm. It's black. And and you can you can fashion some like you can you can actually fashion nanoscale edges. So you can mm -hmm. have, you can get a monomolecular edge Very on sharp. an obsidian dagger. It's nothing sharper in the world, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And, and in fact, the uh, uh, South American tribes uh, did use uh, obsidian blades uh, uh, quite a bit. Um, but the point here is it's, it's glass. So it's not that easy to work with. It's volcanic glass. It's pretty hard, yeah. But it's, 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 it, it can be brittle as well. And you make a mistake, especially in polishing it, especially if it's thin, especially if you put a ridge on it, an annular ridge. Mm. Why? Just, just be happy to get some obsidian. Here, babe, have some obsidian. No, I want an annular ridge. You don't love me. <laughs> and look at this polishing. It's not even oh, nanometer you, surface scale. You, you're going to love it. No. It's, you know how much the time it's going to take me to get that thing done? Exactly. Right? Exactly. Talk about effort versus result. Whoa. Yeah. So, so whoever did this. So, and, and also, we've learned about the lathe. They must have had a lathe. We learned... Mm -hmm that they must have worked to models. Okay, we're talking about a highly organized, highly sophisticated society. Mickey, These I, are not the... I, I just want to give you an example here, right? Um, to make it a modern day coin, did you know that they make it super large size? Yeah, 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 yeah. They carve it in a super large size and then it's scanned and shrunk and, and recarved using a machine called a reducer. Mm -hmm. so they could trace it around the, the the large size object and it creates the small size engraving so they they do that today we do a perfected version in extremely large size like you know, maybe a foot across for a coin that's only an inch or less mm -hmm. and they do all of that that the fine work on the large one and it turns up on the small version now Maggie, i can't i still can't see why and how they would have had that technology back then, let alone something that could polish the surface to be a mirror. Mm -hmm. Crazy. 
But, but it is. But, no, but there these, it these is. It's skills. There. We can see it. It's 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 a thing. I mean, people, again, this is this is whole show is about the smoking gun, and people asking the question: Well, where's your cell phone in the desert? You know, where where's your mm-hmm. um, computer in in in, in the uh, uh, burial yeah, chamber? I have to tell They've you, they, they annoy me every time I hear those. Yeah, I know, because people don't don't take the time. They look at a, a stone monument. They go, oh, yeah, there it is. And no longer interested in, in inquiring as to how it was built. Could we do it today? How was it done? And why was it done? What, what, can you do it? Can we do it? Can we do it today? No, no. And, 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 and the thing is, some of the things we actually can't do. Some of the things we could do, but we, we, we don't because it's just ridiculous. It's too expensive. It takes too long. It's, there's much easier ways of doing things, right? So, um, Dave, why, why, don't you, why, don't you tell, what, why don't you tell us what that can say about the ancient stone workers and then, then I'll uh, I'll take the second part of it but just go through all the points that yeah. we have listed there yeah I, I've actually I, 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 an image just went past on the YouTube feed oh, uh, great. where they had tube drills drill bits and the machinery to hold them steady and apply rotational torque also the same um, machinery would also require a completely parallel depth of motion of the device mm-hmm. that the drill bit the head um they had saws that would cut granite with ease and precision none of this copper thing with sand in there that's ridiculous i have to, that's my that's what i believe they had the ability to sculpt the hardest of rocks it's there we can see it it looks like even scoop marks like it was mm-hmm. soft or something we don't know they were accomplished at finishing granite in situ like where it lay after a block had been placed in a wall or on the surface of the pyramid so they had the ability to cut level and polish granite to a sophisticated degree of flatness we've seen that the the sarcophagus the inside of it is glass finished if if someone Mecky asked me can you I, I want the outside rough cut but the inside's got to be perfect and i go okay mm. well what do you mean perfect oh you know what right angles oh we can do right angles what about mm. polished oh don't wait you're only going to close it up with a dead person in it right so what are they going to see no no, no. <laughs> that'll be a million dollars still do it i should have put the price up yeah right yeah it, it, we had proof that they had lathes that would turn and polish granite. Also, not just granite, but schist and basalt and, and other stones in ways we have not duplicated. We do stuff with metal all the time. We just don't oh, do yeah. it with stone. That's right. So for, for us, stone's too brittle to do this work with. And we only do this kind of stuff to precious stones. We don't do it to everyday stone. Ridiculous. They had the means to cut extremely accurate parallel limestone joints with remarkable flatness over large surface areas that 35 square feet or more and had apparently had apparently had <laughs> had apparently had mastered the technique before beginning the casing of the Great Pyramid at Giza. They had the knowledge to t- uh, and technology to consistently lift exactly maneuver and delicately place enormous weights of stone and finally they had the means and motivation to quarry and move millions of stone blocks and don't Mm. forget these stone blocks are all different shapes and sizes absolutely it it doesn't stop there though because they also had the administrative skill and wealth to organize enormous multi-generational public works and all that comes with that, all the requirements that that would uh, be placed upon society, hundred percent. Mm-hmm. Now, a multi-generational, right? Now, was it multi-generational? The jury is out on that, as far I as I'm concerned. I think we just used it as an excuse because it took a long time. Correct. So, very long-term planning and project continuity. These are these are the attributes of that particular society. They also had the commitment of many generations of craftsmen, from youthful apprenticeship through retirement from the workforce again that's something we believe i i personally believe that these projects were completed much quicker Mm. the commitment of the entire family related to the craftsmen these projects were long-term and the workers must have lived nearby as part of a sizable pyramid 
construction town, for example. I mean, the other, I mean, look at Machu Picchu and places like that. Many generations of capable personnel, from leadership through executive designers to journeyman masters, craftsmen, laborers, and support staff, tens of thousands of people training for years and working together as a cohesive workforce for many decades. The pyramid builders of ancient Egypt seem to have achieved the implementation of the largest, most ambitious, and most long term engineering and construction program in the history of mankind. In concert, of course, with all the other megalithic buildings or mm. building sites that were going on at the same time all around the world. These massive projects would include all facets of civil engineering, architecture, surveying, multi-level and multifaceted personnel management, physical infrastructure, materials management, etc., etc., etc. Initially, they would have to have been preceded by the appearance of a leadership so effective that the undertaking of such immense programs and all the sacrifices they entailed would have been possible to initiate in the first place. Mm. By what steps did they arrive at such a sophisticated political, organizational and technical stage of cultural development? That's the smoking gun, everybody. These are the smoking guns. This this is not a smoking gun. This is a freaking this is a, it's it's an arsenal. It's an armory. Okay? It's not smoking, it's on fire. The armory is on fire. That's what's happening here. And there's I mean uh, look um, there are probably 20 references actually no, it's not true. There are probably 30 of yeah, about yeah. 30 references uh, that we took. Um and it it is really just just take a breath in a second and think about all this. It's astounding. That this happened and again not in one place if this was one place ah it's a freak you know it's a freak okay you've seen the pictures you've seen the photographs of of, of the uh, the blocks the clamps mm -hmm. the quarry marks even. you've seen how they're placed together you've seen you've seen how they were worked you've seen the final results and 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 the, the question always remains why why would you do it like this the obsidian why, why even bother with obsidian, right? As, 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 a, as a bracelet, for example, right? It's beautiful, don't get me wrong. But they're easier things to do and easier materials to work with. It's astounding. And, and this is the thing. This was 10,000 years ago, everybody. Between 10 and 15,000 years ago, that's when this happened. How much time had to uh, elapse for these things to develop, yeah. for these cultures to reach their high point. How long were these cultures around to develop what they had at that time? And then all of a sudden, snuffed out, Dave. Tools down event snuffed out. I, but you know what? We don't see any evolution of that building technique. No. It just arrives, it's here, it's done, and then they're gone. Yeah, we see a devolution, mm. right? And we can see it very clearly. The Pyramid of Sakura is not the oldest. Right, that's I mean that's that's the yeah. side, but also the, the one of the best examples of of devolution is is the Jupiter complex or the Jupiter Temple in Baalbek, mm. where the foundational platform is the oldest, and then the Jupiter Temple, and then the little fortresses they built on top. Each successive building stage less magnificent than the one before. So the further back in time you go, the more accomplished and the more amazing the the structures were. It should be the other way around, Dave. Right? It should be. The other way around, but it isn't. I reckon and the that's... pyramid that's that's the step pyramid uh, mm. is so terrible. I believe that what would would have happened was that you know. So you made the pyramids, yeah, yeah, we made them, yeah, yeah. yeah. People made. Hey, can you make another one? Oh, we, yeah. there's no reason to really. Well, yeah. you know, I don't believe you. Yeah. Go ahead and make one. I'll wait for yeah. you. And then they made it. Went. Yeah, we're not really good at it. I think we figured uh, out how to make them. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> But that, that's 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 yeah, hundred percent. So look, there, there's there's another special case we want to share with you here, which is more fundamentally related to to our existence today. Um, you know, while while the uh, the work in stone is uh, mm -hmm. astoundingly uh, impressive, uh, ultimately it doesn't really have an impact on us. I mean, apart from amazing us, right? And and you know, can we do it? Well, probably not. But this next one, the special case, affects us every day. Without it we wouldn't be where we are today. And I always said, um, ah, Reg, oh, sorry, I'm going to answer this uh, mm -hmm. uh, question from the chat real quick. Uh, Reg asked, uh, hello, Mackie, what do you think of the idea that they floated the blocks into place using water locks? Yeah, absolutely. I've seen uh, I've seen the drawings of that. This is uh, specifically for the uh, pyramids at Giza. And it, it's, it's definitely um, a possibility, but the building of the water locks and the, and the um, I guess, the um, infrastructure the aqua sorry the, yeah the aqueducts that you would have to build 
that as well as a ramp there's a theory of, of a sand or dirt ramps mm -hmm. that could have, uh, you know move the stones the construction effort for those aqueducts and for the uh, uh, sand ramps and such would have been greater than the construction effort for the pyramids themselves mm -hmm. impossible no absolutely not and and it does it lends itself it does lend itself as, as a good explanation so a uh, wrench yeah absolutely valid point um but but the effort associated with that actually dwarfs of building the pyramids interestingly enough interestingly enough and, and um, the, the argument to support the those two methods or alternative methods or combinations of them um is that they just simply had a lot of resource mm. so yeah I'm not, I'm, I'm not discounting it because no one was there that's alive today there isn't any any proof on either way to prove any of it in any way because we can't date the stone or we can date the actual stone, but not when it was cut and placed. Yeah. So the, the, there's problems everywhere. However, the design, Mekki, the design is, it seems a way above the technology of the people living there at the time. As we have given them credit for, yes. That's Correct. absolutely right. So Correct. it was clearly built. It's there. There's too much that's still unknown about it and nothing was word of mouth and kept and understood about its function yes so yes yeah it it, it it starts to ask more questions than have valid answers correct and sj you're correct flotation has no lift limit size or no lift limit limitations so that's you right. can lift anything you want if you've got a flotation device 100 percent correct again yeah. Could you building these aqueducts the entire area from the river all the way around and being able to do it and having what did we yeah. estimate Mickey there was a thousand blocks a day that had to be put in place placed uh, yeah placed right. yeah uh, so sort of cut from their destination yeah. and brought uh, in, in a conveyor belt of floating devices yeah. again not, not a possible 100 except like I said the uh, actual constru construction effort of these uh, aqueducts would have dwarfed um yeah. <laughs> the the uh, the construction of the pyramids it's a great uh, idea itself I, I, yeah. I like the idea yeah and still uh, thinking about how high the pyramid is itself the aqueducts would have had to have exceeded that to yes. float it and place it so it starts to look a little unlikely when you when you think about the true scale of that, that would have had to have been but again, uh, definitely a possibility. Also uh, to consider is it's not just the um, setting of the stones, transportation of the stones, but you need to look at the, um, and since we're talking about the pyramid here for a second, you need to look at the um, precise alignment of the pyramid mm. to, to the cardinal points, you, the, the precise alignment to where it was actually built in the world, and it has experienced no uh, sinkage. Oh, mm -hmm. subsidence, as, as it calls. I like sinkage, but it's, it's subsidence. So subsidence today, we we are okay with ten centimeters every hundred years. Ten centimeters for hundred years is good. What that means is, if your house, um, if your house sinks into the ground by ten centimeters every hundred years, that's acceptable, right? That's subsidence mm -hmm. today. The pyramids have sunk exactly no centimeters <laughs> into the ground because they're built on a granite shelf, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and that and. When it was originally conceived and built, it had uh, white casing stones, we believe maybe a gold uh, little topping as well. Mm -hmm. And it would have been seen for miles and miles around because it would have it would shone quite brightly in, in the in the sunlight. And it was it was a magnificent sight to behold. And then the internal structures, the placing of the see the placing the sarcophagus would have been would have had to be placed into the pyramid as it was constructed around it. At because that, there's no that way layer of yeah. construction, yeah. Correct. Correct. And look, Reg, you're right. It, it, it's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot of work either way. Correct. <laughs> that's why I do it, right? Mm -hmm. And but that's only one side. You know, we we've got these other sides, all over the world uh, with the same uh, construction techniques and sometimes even more amazing construction techniques. But mm. um, but look, these are all valid questions. Thank you very much uh, for 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 the uh, questions and uh, participation from the chat room. That's awesome. And um, the next case though is agriculture. The special case is agriculture. Dave, the, the, why did cities first come about? I mean, look. I, I firmly believe that cities first came about because a large population was needed in a specific place. Because because hunter gatherers, Dave, for the longest time had a really good time. Hunter gatherers, they were just doing it, you know, doing the thing, and all of a sudden, you know, someone decided, you know, some some few thousand years ago, hey, let's build cities. I think there was a very I'm specific put down purpose roots here, and yeah. Uh, be damned if I'm walking around anymore. I want to yeah. stay in one place. <laughs> That's right. And uh, even though. Uh, 
they, they had a fairly easy life, right? Um, and and I, I believe there are a number of uh, things that come together. It's never a simple explanation, of course. But at some point, somebody decided to build cities. Okay, and again, I, I, I submit here it was done and not when we think it was done. It was done much, much earlier. Then this, mm -hmm. that civilization was, was destroyed. And then we started to, to need cities again because we needed a concentrated workforce in a specific place. But the question, right, to, to, to the, uh, where, where cities is the answer is, is you have to be in a certain place. So that the question is, oh, I've got, you know, how do I, how do, I do this thing that I want to do, like mining or whatever it is? Oh, you've got to build a city with people. So question is, how do I do this thing here in this one place? Answer, city. The... The question of cities, right? If, if the cities come, well, cities, question mark, the answer is, well, uh, you know, you need agri agriculture and domestication of animals. Why? Because you've got a stationary, sedentary workforce that's not going anywhere. Mm. You have to feed them, right? So if you have a city, right? So the question of cities, therefore, is answered by agriculture. City? Agriculture, right? Or, in fact, domestication of animals. Same thing, really. Um, but one makes no sense without the other. Right? There's no point having agriculture if you don't have cities. Similarly, why have cities if you don't have agriculture? Because you can't feed those suckers. You just can't. It's, not, it's a symbiotic relationship. And somebody figured that out. So as soon as you needed cities or had cities, you needed agriculture. Now, the origin of hypothesis officially is this. Scholars have developed a number of hypotheses to explain the historical origins of agriculture. Studies of the transition from hunter-gatherer to agricultural societies indicate an antidecent sorry, antecedent period of intensification and increasing sedentism. What it means is people were starting to settle down, right? Uh, examples are the uh, Natufian culture in the Levant, which is uh, the Tigris-Euphrates, uh, uh, you know, riverland, um, Mesopotamia, if you will, and the early Chinese Neolithic in China. Current models indicate that wild stands that had been harvested previously started to be planted, but were not immediately domesticated. Localized climate change is the favorite explanation of, for the origins of agriculture in the Levant. Again, this is the uh, area what's now Iran and Iraq. When major climate change took place after the last ice age, about 11,000 BC, again, this is, it's, Dave, it's all around, it's all hinging around that last ice age when it came to an end, you know, the, the, right. the catastrophe mm -hmm. that we think ended the last civilization, right? Yeah. This is, so it's the, again, between 10 and 15,000 years ago. That's a long time. Much of the earth became subject to long dry seasons. These conditions favored annual plants, which die off in the long dry season, leaving a dormant seed or tuber. An abundance of readily storable wild grains and pulses enabled hunter gatherers in some areas to form the first settled village in this time. So, not entirely true, because there wasn't terribly much storable wild grain around. Have you seen wild grain? It's grass. Grass mm -hmm. is grains okay somebody looked at grass one day and hey i can see a cake <laughs> okay i look at a stalk of grass i see grass or right? you know maybe a photo for my horse but these people were so amazingly foresighted they could see cakes and pastries and bread and all these wonderful things <laughs> right so now to me this is a stretch at the best of times it, it, it just doesn't make sense and we'll, we'll get into it i don't want to take too much away dave why don't you tell us why humans started farming Hunter-gatherers worked less, had more varied diets, and better health. So why did we switch to agriculture? On paper, farming and domestication sounds pretty good. Have some land, grow some food, raise some animals. It's one of those things that has gotten us to where we are today, for better or worse. Given the habitat destruction, soil damage, water contamination, animal rights issues, and loss of crop biodiversity, for starters, I'm going with worse. But hunters and gatherers had it pretty good. They worked less, ate a greater variety of food, and were healthier. So what nudged them into farming? According to a new study from the University of Con Connecticut, the shift away from hunting and gathering towards agriculture has long been baffling to scientists. And that switch happened independently around the globe, heightens the mystery. A lot of evidence suggests, this is a quote, divest, uh, a lot of evidence suggests domestication of agriculture doesn't make much sense, says Elik Waitzel, 
a PhD student at Yukon's Department of Anthropology and lead author of the study, hunter-gatherers are sometimes working fewer hours a day, their health is better, and their diets are more varied, so why would anyone switch over and start farming? Now that's probably the longest book title of I'd probably need a really, really big book to put that on. <laughs> I would have condensed that down. So that's a working title. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, that's called a working title. <laughs> well, I've got that one. <laughs> it's a question that many have pondered. And in doing so, have arrived at two plausible theories. One is that in times of abundance, humans had the leisure to start experimenting in domestication of plants. The other theory, number two, suggests that in lean times, thanks to population growth and over-exploitation exploitation of resources and a changing climate, etc., domestication was a way to supplement diets. Can so, I just... Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, I just want to quickly give you a third uh, possibility oh, here, which they didn't mention. And, and the third possibility is that, that somebody needed to build cities. Cities had to be built for whatever reason. Yeah, so it's just okay. the chicken and the egg, right? And they're they're basically just those two options. Don't suggest that you know. I I'd actually say the need to build cities could be around uh, trading, trading with other people. So you come together at a single location to trade your wares, and then people don't want to walk away from there back to somewhere else, and they set up stumps. You know, they set up hi their home there, and um, you know, once you get some agriculture going, it's you're you're usually producing more than you need. It's the economy of scale, so that would be self-sufficient uh, and self-satisfying. It would create a city. Um, but so Witzel, going back to the text, decided to test both of those two original theories. Not they didn't test Mecky's theory uh, <laughs> by analyzing a specific place, the eastern United States asking was there some imbalance between resources and the human populations that led to domestication he started testing both theories by looking at animal bones from the last 13,000 years recovered from six archaeological sites of human settlements in northern alabama and the tennessee river valley he also looked at pollen data taken from sediment cores gathered from lakes and wetlands the data provides a record about the plant life form from different periods. A Yukon, so as U-C-O-N-N -N explains, Wietzel found evidence that, uh, that forests uh, of oak and hickory trees began to dominate the areas as the climate warmed. This is this, the ice shield, ice sheet started melting but also led to decreasing water levels in lakes and wetlands. The study notes climatic warming and drying during the middle Holocene, growing human populations and oak slash hickory forest expansion were the likely drivers for these changes in foraging efficiencies. In the meantime, the bone record reveals a shift from diets rich in waterfowl and big fish to smaller shellfish. Taken together that the data provides evidence for the second hypothesis, says Witzel. There was some kind of imbalance between the growing human population and the resource base, affected perhaps by exploitation and also by climate change. But that said, it's actually not so cut and dry. Witzel also found indicators subtle, sub, subtly pointing to the first theory as well. The new forest boosted game species population. That is what we see in the animal bone data, says Weasel. Fundamental, fundamentally, when times are good and there are lots of animals present, you'd expect people to hunt the prey that is most efficient, says Weasel. Deer are more efficient than squirrels, for, as, for example, which is smaller with less meat and more difficult to catch. But even so, if larger game, like deer, is overhunted or if the landscape changes to one less favourable for the animal population, 
humans must subsist on other smaller, less efficient food sources, notes Yukon. Agriculture, despite being hard work, may have become a necessity, a necessary option to supplement diet when imbalances like these occurred, he says. In the end, Witzel concluded that the findings point to a theory number two, that domestication came about as food supplies became less than ideal. And his main quote here is, I think that the existence of declining efficiency in even one habitat type is enough to show that domestication happening in times of plenty isn't the best way to understand initial domestication, he says. Witzel also believes that looking towards the past at questions like this and how humans have coped and adapted to change may help to enlighten us in the face of today's warming climate. Having an archaeological voice backed by this deep time perspective in policy is making is very important, he says. Given that progress is what he sp has sparked this round of climate change, if only we could turn, of course, our course around and start hunting and gathering again, less work, more varied diets, and better health. Why would you want anything less? Yes, yes, else? absolutely. Now, I don't know how much time we have, um, but five we won't minutes. get to five minutes. Uh, we'll, yeah, it won't be, no, won't be enough. Yeah, I'll, 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 okay, I'll try. First evidence of farming in Middle East 23,000 years ago. This was published in 2015 um, by the American Friends of the Tel Aviv University. And this is the summary here very quickly. Until now, researchers believe farming was invented some 12,000 years ago in an area that was home to some of the earliest known human civilizations. A new discovery offers the first evidence that a that tribal plant cultivation began far earlier, some 23,000 years ago, which, so, no, sorry, no, I have to say this, which means we probably won't be able to finish this particular section. Um, we've always said the more we learn, the further back in time we will push everything, Dave. Mm. Be and that's exactly what's happening here. The origin of, of uh, I guess, the human species, the origin of cities, uh, Goebelki Tepe, the origin of agriculture, the origin of stonework, now firmly, a uh, place 10 to 15,000 years ago with, with astounding work. So the, the more we learn, the further back in time we go. Just wanted to put that out there. Until now, researchers believe farming was invented some 12,000 years ago in the cradle of civilization, Iraq, the Levant, parts of Turkey and Iran. So, you know, the modern Middle East, more or less. An area that was home to some of the earliest known human civilizations. A new discovery by an international collaboration of researchers from Tel Aviv University, Harvard University, Bar Ilan University, and the University of Haifa offers the first evidence that trial plant cultivation began far earlier, some 23,000 years ago. The study focuses on the discovery of the first wheat species at the site of a sedentary human camp on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. It was published in PLOS One and led by Professor Ehud Weiss of Bar Ilan University in collaboration with Professor Marcelo Sternberg of the Department of Molecular Biology and Ecology of Plants at Taos, Faculty of Life Sciences, and Professor Ofer Bar Yosef of Harvard University, among other colleagues. While full scale agriculture didn't develop until much later, our study shows that trial cultivation began far earlier than previously believed and gives us reason to think our ancestors' capabilities, said Professor Sternberg. Those early ancestors were more clever and more skilled than we knew. Now, why did 11,000 years elapse before agriculture was taken up for real? Our written history goes back 5,000 years. Let's be mm -hmm. let's put this in perspective here for yeah, a second, yeah, yeah. Dave, right? Yeah, yeah. So they're saying it started 23,000 years ago, but then for 11,000 years, not much happened. We're still, you know, hanging around, doing our thing, this and that. No, no. This doesn't actually make sense as a narrative, I'm sorry. Now, the next section is called Evidence Among Weeds. All the weeds are considered a threat or nuisance in farming. Their presence at the site of the Ohalo II People's Camp revealed uh, the earliest sign of trial plant cultivation, some 11 millennia earlier than conventional ideas about the onset of agriculture. The plant material was found at the site of the Ohalo II people, who were fisher hunter gatherers and established a sedentary human camp. The site was unusually well preserved, having been charred, covered by lake sediment, and sealed in low. Uh, oxygen conditions, ideal for the preservation of plant material. The researchers examined the weed species for morphological signs of domestic type cereals and harvesting tools, although their very presence is evidence itself 
of early farming. This uniquely preserved site is one of the best archaeological examples of uh, worldwide rather of the hunter gatherers way of life, said Professor Sternberg. It was possible to recover an extensive amount of information on the site and its inhabitants. Because weeds thrive in, in cultivated fields and disturbed soils, a significant presence of weeds in archaeobotanical assemblages retrieved from Neolithic sites and settlements of, late, of, of later age is widely considered an indicator of syst systematic cultivation, uh, says the study. Uh, we'll leave it there. We're probably going to read it again next week. We're going to start here. But just, just to be very clear, it, it, is, it makes absolutely no sense as a narrative for something to have been developed and then not much happens to it over the intervening space of 11,000 years. Not only that, they were lucky to find such a well-preserved site. And the only reason they could make the, uh, you know, the, the, the study that they did make or, you know, uh, make the claims they make is because they did find this, this uniquely um, preserved site, this uniquely um, preserved human settlement. Again, a tiny little settlement on a huge planet, right? Uh, we're the luckiest species on the planet, Dave. We're finding the mechanism of endocathera. We're finding, you know, all kinds of things which are unique yeah, and point. the only ones ever made, right? Um, I have a really big problem with that. So, and, and we'll come to this because I will, we will share with you next week a, 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 an article by um, Will Hart, um, who wrote the book, I think, uh, Everything He Knows Wrong. I've got it on my shelf. And uh, his article is called Mysterious Origins of Crop Plants. And he'll throw a little, um, he'll throw a little other light on this whole um agricultural thing so for next next week we will go uh, we'll uh, you know do the uh, first evidence of farming uh, uh, 23,000 years ago and then we go to will hart and it will open your eyes to a whole bunch of things i hope uh, which are very very interesting and the most important thing to understand here is we have not been able to cultivate anything today we have not been able to domesticate any uh, any single wild plant we haven't we have done, you know, biological, you know, gene manipulation, all that. We've done, you know, grafting and we've done uh, cultivation of stuff that already existed. But we ourselves as a civilization have not gone through the process of going from wild to domesticated plant. Just to be clear. That's music. Stay tuned for Jair Bears after our show to take through to nine o'clock in the morning. Kentucky time.